Thank you truly, and good evening to all of you, and it's great to be here. <coughs> Just give us a moment to set up here and make sure it's all working. days of the Great War. A song competition was held in London. The organisers hoped to find a song that would help to build the optimism and morale of the British people and their armed services. The competition was held and a winner was found. The rules stated that the winning song would be one that caused people to whistle and sing even when German shells and bombs were raining down upon them. And the prize was awarded to, and I wonder if any of you happen to know, <laughs> who won that 1915 song competition. Anybody, any idea? <coughs> I'm not too sure you'll even know the song, unless you were uh, uh, as old as Alice and I am, born in Australia, <laughs> or Great Britain, or somewhere like that. It was actually uh, the quite snappy song, Pack Up Your Troubles in Your Old Kit Bag. Any of you ever heard that? No, no. Or know it? Nobody, except me and Alison. We have. <coughs> Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, <coughs> smile, smile. And then I lift out a couple of lines. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Well, that was back in 1915. And the British people took that song to their hearts and it was sung and warbled throughout the British Isles and throughout the British Armed Services and soon crossed the Atlantic and the Pacific and sundry other oceans and um, was just as popular in America, Australia and, and other countries <coughs> as it was in Great Britain. Indeed, late into the 1940s, Alice and I were still hearing it sometimes played on uh, our radios. It was widely sung and widely known. It appeared again in 1979 in a film, All That Jazz, and later still in a 2014 video game. So as recently as four years ago, it was still being presented to the public. Very nearly a hundred years after it was written. Very few popular songs have lasted that long. But this one did. If I had a better voice, I'd sing it to you. Uh, spare your ears and uh, spare my blushes and be content just to quote the words. It has been called perhaps the most optimistic song ever written. Yet the man who composed that merry tune, Staff Sergeant Felix Powell, later committed suicide by shooting himself through the heart with his own rifle. That sad event highlights the difference between human optimism and the invincible joy that those who believe in him find in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Rather strangely, perhaps Jesus himself preempted the song with some of his words, places in the Gospels where he tells us to stop worrying, start believing. Indeed, had the idea occurred to him, he might well have said, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, mm -hmm. smile. Because he effectively uh, expressed those sentiments, but had a much better reason to do so than the composers of the 1915 song did. Which brings us to our text where Jesus tells us to do just that. 
In this world, said Jesus, you will have many troubles, but cheer up, for I have overcome the world. Amen. So there he effectively tells us, forget about your troubles, pack them up, <coughs> smile, smile, smile. But then he gave us a reason to do that, which the songwriters in 1915 were simply unable to do. What was the reason? He said, I have overcome the world. And that brings us to the title of this message, Living Life to the Full, a study on the power of faith in God. We have to learn to confront the sometimes crushing burdens of life with cheerful optimism. And there's no doubt that what Jesus said was true enough. <coughs> In this world we do face trouble. Sometimes many troubles. Greater troubles, lesser troubles. <coughs> Although I don't suppose any of us have ever, have to, ever had to face anywhere near the troubles that uh, Christian martyrs have had to do in centuries gone by and still today in some parts of the world suffer violent persecution, torn to pieces by wild animals, burned and strangled, raped and robbed, tortured and tormented in every imaginable way. But the words came to them too. In the midst of these troubles, you can find in Christ a reason to smile. Smile. What's the use of worry? Never was worthwhile. So pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile. Smile, smile. Which the British people learned to do. Uh, the German bombs and shells were raining down on them and their cities were reduced to rubble. But even if we don't suffer as much as some have, nonetheless, into each life, some rain must fall. We all have our quotient of troubles. The Lord measures pain to each one of us as we're able to receive it and take it and in Him overcome it. So in the strength of those words, we have to learn how to begin each day, each new day, <coughs> energised by the all-conquering dynamic of miracle-working faith. That's what I want to talk to you about today. How can you do that? I want to put before you four propositions. And here's the first of them. Proposition one. You cannot avoid this. What is this you cannot avoid? <coughs> it is indeed trouble. trouble. Jesus was Adam. In this world you will have many troubles. He didn't suggest that you might. He didn't suggest that some people will breeze through life handily and never have to suffer any uh, deprivation, any pain, any loss, any hurt, any suffering of any sort, any persecution, any uh, resistance, any warfare in their lives. No. In this world, said Jesus to his disciples and to us, you will, you will have troubles, sometimes many troubles. The problem is people often feel when trouble does hit them that they must blame themselves as if they were lacking in faith, as if somehow had they been believing God properly, uh, they never would have suffered these things. Indeed, I actually heard a preacher preaching a sermon in church one day, talking about Paul and all the things that Paul had to suffer. <coughs> Stoned, shipwrecked several times, flogged several times with rods and with the uh, Roman lash, imprisoned on numerous occasions, 
and on and on Paul lists the sufferings he had to endure for the gospel. And this preacher having uh, gone through the catalogue of Paul's pains and suffering and troubles said the trouble with Paul was he wasn't believing God properly, what? said this preacher. The Lord had really known how to believe God. <laughs> These things never would have happened to him. Well, I have a fair idea what Paul would say to that. <laughs> and indeed what he will say in the day of resurrection when he confronts that bloke and uh, shakes him till his teeth rattles and tell him you have not got a clue what you were talking about. Yeah. <coughs> but people are like that. They do blame themselves when troubles come on them as if they were lacking in faith. When their business goes bankrupt or a sickness overtakes them or a loved one dies prematurely or their children uh, walk off and leave them or you can go <coughs> on and on listing the uh, catalogue of woes and worries and pains and troubles that uh, hurt people from time to time. We're all aware of that. We all know how disastrous that can be. But it's crazy to blame yourself. For troubles do not mean that you have no faith. <clears throat> Rather, they are a signal to rise up and use your faith. An opportunity to believe God. An opportunity to see a miracle. An opportunity to touch some aspect of God's wonder-working power which may not prevent the trouble, sometimes may not even cure it, but at least brings you to victory in the midst of it and brings you uh, the deep joy that comes from Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation he has achieved for us. Amen. And you should never doubt that. <coughs> never doubt the goodness of God. Amen. Never doubt that whatever happens, yeah. Could not happen unless God allowed it. Amen. As Jesus said to uh, Pontius Pilate, you could have no power over me Amen. unless God had allowed it. And that is exactly true for us yes. too. Whatever happens, it had to go past the heavenly throne first. Amen. It didn't necessarily have God's approval, but at least his agreement that this should be done. Yeah. As in the case of Job. When the devil came to God and said, look at that fellow Job down there. Look how he's prospering. And he's got every reason to prosper. Because you keep your hand on him and nothing ever troubles him. But says the devil to God, let me strike him. Let me hurt him. And there'll be some changes take place. Well, God didn't agree with that. But he said at any rate, okay devil, you do what you please. So he agreed. I don't think God liked it, I don't think God approved it, but he agreed. And he often does that. He agrees that things may happen to us, not beyond our strength to bear it, not beyond our capacity to overcome it, not past what his own grace has given us, but within his grace, within our strength, within our capacity to endure and to overcome, he allows things to happen and it does not impinge on his goodness. He remains a good God. Amen. He remains a loving God. And the word still remains true that whatever happens is in the end for our good, for our benefit. Yeah. God works everything together for good if we love him Amen. and serve him and believe his promise. Amen. Never doubt that Jesus has conquered the world, Amen. not for himself, but for you and for me, so that in him we too become more than conquerors and we can kick our troubles to one side and smile, 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 because we have victory in Christ. Proposition number two, let the peace of Christ prevail. Take heart said Jesus, or cheer up, or be brave, or take courage. The Greek phrase can be translated in a number of ways. That is, rid yourself of fear and set yourself to trust in the goodness of God. 
Charles and I have both been serving God since our mid-teens, uh, 70 years ago. <laughs> I'm 85, she's 84, I'll be 86 in two or three months and she'll be 85, catching up to me slowly but sure. <laughs> <laughs> And we've been married 65 years uh, on March the 6th. Oh, yes. And while God has done many wonderful things for us and given us many wonderful miracles and uh, divine blessings too numerous to mention, nonetheless you had better believe we have had our share of troubles, mm. of burdens, mm. of problems. Mm. I have to confess that no one's ever taken a whip to me, or the one like threatened to, uh, and uh, no one's uh, ever done any serious harm, although I've had a couple of fellows with guns in their hand threaten to blow my head off my shoulders until I called their bluff and disarmed them, and uh, no one's ever put me in prison or anything like that, but nonetheless we have had our share yeah. of trouble. We've had to face death in our family with the loss of one of our children. Our second born, who died a day or so after he was born, little Gavin, now safe in the arms of Jesus. And we've been waiting uh, 63 or years or more to see him once again. And maybe we've got another 10 or 20 years to wait. I've got only five. Uh, but eventually, we hope to see him again and have our family united once again. But through it all, in God's grace, we found a way to take heart, not to surrender to fear, to believe in the goodness of God, Amen. to know that He is gone, and to affirm that to ourselves time and time again. God, I know you are good. I don't understand what's happening to us. I don't understand what's happening to me or my wife or whatever. I, I don't understand these circumstances or, or this situation you, you've allowed us to fall into. But nonetheless, you are good. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. And working all things together yes. for good Amen. to us. Amen. One has to believe that. Mm -hmm. Casting off fear. Because this is a true proposition. The victory of Christ over the world can do you no good while you stay afraid. Fear <coughs> creates an impenetrable barrier to faith. Yes. That's why Jesus did not say, believe and you will not fear. Rather he said, stop being afraid and you will believe. Mm -hmm. Fear not, believe only is the sequence Christ used with good reason. Because you have to banish fear before you can believe God. Yeah. And so we have a choice between fear or faith, prison or freedom. One pulls us toward ruin, the other toward a miracle of answered prayer. Allow fear to dominate your mind, your heart, your spirit. Allow fear to take you in its possession and keep you captive. And it will drag you down to ruin. Mm. <clears throat> Cast off that fear and set yourself to believe in the goodness of God and to trust His promise. Amen. To cheer up because Christ has conquered the world for you. Set yourself to do that. And it will haul you toward a miracle of answered prayer. <clears throat> and this is the choice that you alone can make. I alone can make. No one can make it for you. We alone can and must choose whether fear or faith will be the dominating force in our lives. So you cannot avoid trouble. But whatever the trouble is, you can let the peace of Christ <coughs> prevail, Amen. casting off fear, Amen. holding firm to your faith in God until deliverance comes. Amen. The third proposition, victory begins within you. 
The lively Greek word used by Jesus in our text is properly translated as cheer up. It could also be rendered uh, take heart, as I think the King James Version has it, or be brave, or take courage, and similar sorts of expressions. But cheer up probably uh, catches the uh, lively sense of the original best. It's a vigorous word, it's a tough word, it's a tough expression Jesus uses. Cheer up, says he, cheer up. Mm. Every time we're going to tell you guys, cheer up. <laughs> it's the kind of impact it should have on us as we hear it or read it. The Greek expression occurs in six different settings in the Gospels. Five of them spoken by Christ and one of them spoken by a mob. Jesus said cheer up to the paralyzed man when their friends brought him uh, to the house where Jesus was and had to climb up onto the roof and break a hole in the roof and let their friend down on ropes because there were so many people crowded around Christ. And when Jesus saw him there lying in this, on this stretcher, paralyzed, Jesus said to him, cheer up. Jesus spoke the words to Veronica, the woman who had the issue of blood, who had just walked some 75 kilometers from northern Palestine down to Galilee where Jesus was ministering. All the time saying to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. There's a particular sense of the Greek there, which means she was doing this continually. If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And she did. And she took a terrible risk doing it. Because to appear in public and to walk among the people with an issue of blood put her at risk of being stoned to death right then and there if the crowd discovered it. Yes. <clears throat> so some commentators said that she was actually saying to herself, because she was terrified, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And in her fear, she, she came in behind him, but she was struggling to repress that fear, to cast it off, mm -hmm. and to find a place to believe God. And so she kept on saying, don't be afraid, just get somewhere where he can't see you and the, and the mob won't notice you and touch his gun and you'll be made whole. She kept saying that to herself, overcoming fear, stirring up her faith in the promise of God. And she touched him. And Jesus turned to her and said, Cheer up, daughter. Your faith has made you whole. It was spoken to the disciples on the Sea of Galilee when they were out at sea uh, at midnight and uh, the storm broke out and the boat was being tossed around and Jesus came across the water, walking on the water toward the boat and we are told they all howled in terror. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, cheer up! Well, I'm not a ghost. This is really me. Cheer up! Don't be afraid. Amen. It was spoken by Jesus, by the mob to blind Bartimaeus. He learned that Jesus was passing by him and he began to uh, cry at the top of his voice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me! Have mercy on me! <coughs> and apparently Jesus ignored him and just walked right past him and kept on going down the road. Ignoring him. But then uh, someone told Jesus about this blind man who was calling out. And so Jesus stopped. Surprisingly, uh, you'd have thought he would have gone back to the blind man. But he didn't. He just stopped it. And he said, all right, well, tell him to come to me. So uh, they ran back to Bartimaeus and took him by the hand and said, cheer up, said they to him. Cheer up! 
Jesus is calling for you. Go then. So, Bartimaeus got to his feet and one presumes someone took him by the hand and led him to where Jesus was patiently waiting. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do? Lord, just give me back my sight. And said Jesus, according to your faith, so be it. And his eyes were opened that moment. But here was the mob was saying to Bartimaeus, Cheer up! He's calling <coughs> for you. And to the disciples, when Jesus told them he was about to be taken away from them, and they would face many troubles. Our text passage. And he said to them, despite those troubles, Cheer up! Because I have overcome the world and everything that is in it. <coughs> and then, uh, after his resurrection and ascension, when Paul was threatened by a rampaging mob in Jerusalem because he had preached about the resurrection, many of them did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. And so they wanted to stone him to death until the Roman army officer rescued him and carried Paul off to the military barracks where he stayed overnight. And sometime during the night, Jesus came to him in a vision and said to him, Cheer up. So all those places, that phrase occurs in the Gospel. And in each case, it was spoken to people who were facing impossible odds. They were in situations that were more conducive to despair than to laughter. So why did Jesus say, cheer up? Why did he make what seems to be such an unreasonable demand? How can you smile? Boy, smile. When well, the whole world is collapsing around you. Or well, the composer of the melody, his brother wrote the words, but uh, he, the staff sergeant wrote the melody to that song. Somehow he couldn't find a way to do it, eventually taking his own life. When his world collapsed all around him and he could find no solution, no way out, no escape from his pain, his grief, his misery, his wretchedness. But the same could have been said of all those people, all six of them that uh, we mentioned, all these all six groups. So why did Jesus make this seemingly absurd demand? Cheer up! Cheer up! Cheer up! Cheer up! Cheer up! He said. <coughs> why? Because he understood the principle that the miracle you need does not begin in God but in your own spirit. Until you do cheer up inside. No matter what's happening in the world around you. Until you do cheer up inside and start to affirm the goodness of God and the power of Jesus Christ who rose from the dead and conquered the world. You will not get a miracle. So before he gave those people any promise, Jesus gave them a command. Cheer up. Which tells us that in every circumstance we are called to be cheerful. To be ready to praise God with all our heart and with all our soul. And notice how in the examples given above, the people did drive away their fears. They did set themselves to believe only. And they all gained the miracle. They desire. And I can say from 65 years of walking hand in hand with God and with each other, as and I have proved that to be true more times than we can count. And in the fourth and final proposition, stand in the triumph 
of Christ. How astonishing is the declaration Jesus made. Remember that when Jesus said, I have overcome the world, Golgotha and all its horrors still lay ahead of him. Yet so confident is he of victory that he asserted an existing triumph. Now that's amazing. He was still looking ahead to the cross, still looking ahead to the promised resurrection that he discovered in Scripture would be his, and his return to the Father's right hand and resuming his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. That was all still ahead of him. And yet he said, I have overcome the world. The world. How could he do that? It was, in fact, a faith statement. That is, Jesus was practicing what he preached. He had every reason to be terrified. He had seen men, perhaps women also, I don't know, but he's certainly seen men crucified. Rotting corpses hanging on a gibbet were quite common throughout the Greek and Roman world at that time. And there certainly would have been uh, on many uh, a hilly prominence a cross with this ghastly victim. And Jesus knew what was involved in the cross. He knew that was what was waiting him in, in Jerusalem. He told his disciples it was going to happen. He warned them of it. And he didn't like that idea any more than you would. Because <coughs> you know what he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm. Father, mm. if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was ahead of him. Mm. He shuddered at the thought of it, as any rational person would. It was an absolutely horrible way to die, being crucified. Mm. Racked with agony, torn with pain. Savage with suffering that could scarcely be endured. But here he did what he told his disciples to do. He cast off that fear. He looked forward to the cross, and as it says in Hebrews, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and all that was involved in it and pressed on. Smile all the way as it were. So Jesus was making a faith statement. Though he had not yet overcome the world, he made it real. I have overcome the world. Just as we are called to do. As John says in his letter, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. It is believing that you have already got the promise of God. That's what Jesus was doing here. He knew what the promise of God was, that he would die and he would rise again from the dead three days later and he would ascend back to heaven's right hand. And he believed that and he affirmed it. And so he said, I have. Not I will, not I hope to, not I pray to, but I have overcome the world. Amen. Thus Jesus himself <coughs> set the example that we should find. So then, let us all resolve now to do the same, to heed the Master's injunction, to cheer up. Why? Because when Christ arose from the grave, he utterly conquered the world on your behalf and on mine. So here's my message summed up. In this life, dear friends, we have to contend with troubles. Christ has given us his endless peace to quench every fear and his limitless strength to carry us into invincible victory both now and forever in paradise, which, let us all say, affirm a
monkey one. That's how you did. So blessed tonight, I mean.
with us to the closing prayer. Thank you. Father, thank you for your unending majesty, your ever-expanding glory, your infinite grace and goodness. Indeed, how great thou art. And we bless you tonight, Father, for letting us get a glimpse into that grace, that goodness, that glory in the void we shared together. Thank you for the Saviour, for his imperishable love victory he gained for us and we can enter into in his name by breathing the name of Jesus and come all and confidence over this world as Jesus himself was and is blessed be his wonderful name and now Father speak your grace and blessing your peace and goodness upon each one of us as we continue in fellowship and later as we Heart to our various homes, to a safe travel, and help us to glorify you as we worship you with your saints in church tomorrow. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.